Thank you so much to the worship team. So as you're continuing in this series, just a reminder, there's that big five in Christianity. That big five that, that helps us to understand the work of, of what was done at the cross, the work that Christ achieved at the cross. It starts off with redemption, our justification, the imputed righteousness, reconciled to God, and that we are now a new creation. We have been regenerated we are a new creation. And through those five things, God shows His glory. Because these are actions, these are works of God to show His glory as to who He is, what He does. It displays His nature, His character through these various actions that He has done. See, God's word and His action are the same. And so if you're wanting to see the glory of God, look to see what he's doing, look to see what he brings about, and that's his nature. The things that he does that brings about who he is. And so today we're looking at justification, or let's use the word justice. Uh, justice is not a popular word, um, because it reminds us of uh, times that you may have gone to court, um, when you got a speeding fine. When you were in trouble, maybe before the headmaster when you were a child, um, I spent many a day before the headmaster. Um, it reminds us of all the wrong that we've done. And many times we don't want to be re-reminded again of the wrong that we've done. It's as though we want to say, just leave it. I know. I know I'm rubbish. <laughs> Don't keep reminding me. But when we look at the nature and the character of God, justice is one of those particular natures and characters. And, and so we need to deal with it. And to deal with it in terms of what Scripture says. So the psalmist gives us a nice summary of the Psalm 89 verse, verse, verse 14. It says, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. This is just that part of that psalm I want you to look at at the moment. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. The very nature, the characteristic of who God is, is found within his righteousness and his justice. So God will always present himself as right and as just, and we can never separate those two, and we can never disregard any of those. Because that's the foundation of his throne. From, from there, he will rule and he will reign. And everything that he does will be motivated by his righteousness and his justice. Now that, for us, we'll be hearing once again this word justice. It brings, okay, what am I in for? Am I in for something that, that I really didn't want to be in for? Um, it may also conjure up images in your mind of going, well, justice seems to be um, part of an angry God, so we'll relegate that to the Old Testament, because it seems as though God in the Old Testament is, is angry, and, and he's a warlike God, and he's doing all these um, angry things. But in, in the New Testament, it seems as though love and faithfulness have gone before him. It's a nice, loving God. And then we move to the final judgment, and that's where we go, okay, he's an angry God again, and that's where he deals with the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons, and they get what was coming to them, and, and they'll be happy again. Now, that would be a totally wrong image of God, because God, right from the beginning to the end, righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. We'll always see God as he is, always with those two characteristics. So we have to ask then, if, if we have a wrong view of justice, where do we get the right view of justice? Because if we um, begin with the wrong view of justice, guess where we are going to end up with a wrong view of justice? If we end with something that's wrong, we always, if we begin with something that is wrong, we always end with something that is wrong. So let's go to where the foundation of the understanding of God's justice, which was decided before time began, and that is at the cross. 
You might say, hang on a second, why do we pack so much into the cross? Well, there is so much that happens at the cross, so much. And it would be uh, uh, foolish to think that the work of the cross is not that deep. That we move on to more important and greater things. The cross is the central work of what God has done. And that's where we ground everything. That work is so deep, we will need an eternity to understand it. That's why we are just skimming the surface of the surface of what we're looking at. Isaiah writing says the following about this work that was done at the cross. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offering, he, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. So with what we do know from Scripture, it pleases God, it is, it is his will, it is his desire. That the work of the cross is the outpouring of the revelation of who he is. This is what God wants to do. This is his desire. So, for God to be able to enact his justice, we must remember it's no simple or easy task. It's not a simple and easy task for him to do it. And, and for us to grasp even a glimpse of it, we must remember that we, we need to investigate at least something of the justice of God. And there, in that investigation, when we look deep into it, this no, no simple or no easy task of God, we will start to see His glory. We'll realize that His justice actually is glorious. So let's dive into this. John in his gospel records these words of Jesus. But this is to fulfill what is written in the law. They hated me without reason. Have you ever thought about that statement now? Now you're thinking through it as you see it's up on the screen. You think about it. Think, think about this. To hate somebody without reason. What goes on within a person? To hate somebody without reason. Ponder on it for, for a moment. What would cause somebody to hate God without reason? Why would they do that? If we had to look at that statement as the starting point, point of our research. We call it our thesis, the starting point of our research. The heart of man is inherently evil. And who can understand that? That's what Jeremiah tells us. And what, what we find is that as we study this justice of God, as opposed to or in relation to this statement, they hated him without reason, we find that we ourselves are in a desperate situation. Because in any responsible research, you always have to look at the opposite side of what you are researching. And so one would call that the antithesis, the opposite side of it. And the antithesis of this particular verse would be, have we given God any logical or reasonable reason why he should forgive us, accept us, and love us? Have we given that to him? You see, that's the question that is presented before the world. Now, whether we try to negotiate ourselves around it, come with great logical and so-called reasonable arguments, or whether we use the um, very well-rounded, mature, deep-seated action of humanity. If you're not there, then there's no problem. 
deny God. <laughs> Whatever we do, we have to, at some point, we have to face the reality. We have given God no reason to forgive, accept, or love us. And so scripture is true when it tells us, Psalm 51 verse 5, Surely I was sinful at birth. And further in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Here is the response that God would give back to us for us not giving any due reason. So how do we unravel this? En enveloped around that verse, Romans 3.23, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God, is this, is, is this profound revelation that helps us to understand the justice of God and how He is glorified. God has bound Himself. He, he has bound Himself and His law to declare that you and I are guilty of sin and deserve hell. Because you have provided God no reason why, we should, why He should forgive, accept, or love us. And there's nothing that qualifies us for life, and that is a horrible realization. And this is the dilemma that we find ourselves in. And only God Himself can address this dilemma. We, 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 we cannot address it. And so... This is that is enveloped around this verse, Romans 3, 20, 23. Let's have a look at this from verse 21. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. So now what's been said here? The main thing here is that apart from the law, the law which is the justice of God, that uh, says that because we have broken that law, we are deserving of death. We have given Him no reason whatsoever why He should Forgive, accept, and love us. It says that apart from the law, that is the justice of God, those, those, those are the Ten Commandments, which reveal to us the holiness of God. There's a revelation that there is a way through the righteousness of God for Him to reach us. And it was there testified through the law and the prophets all along. In other words, it was there in the Old Testament all along, we were just not looking at it the right way. It's been there. And it is in line with his justice. So this is how he begins to reveal his glory through his justice. God's nature is justice. And his justice he must fulfill. It's his priority. He will fulfill that justice. Now, did God forego his justice in order to love us? Because we could say, okay, the fact that, uh, let me digress slightly. We may say, God loves me. But I have foregone the justice. I have moved the justice of God out to one side. We may say that um, God loved me so much that he went to the cross for me. And that would be a wrong statement because, because it's not entirely true. Because Jesus went to the cross because of the justice of God. So his justice must develop something. Something must come from his justice. His justice can say, I will wipe out all of humanity. But his justice has to achieve something else. Remember that Psalm 80, 89 verse, verse 14? It says, righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. But it also says that love and faithfulness go before you. But his justice has to be fulfilled first. So what does this mean for us? 
If God must fulfill His justice, does that mean that I'm in trouble? Yes, it does, but also no. It means that when he fulfills his justice and he glorifies himself, what does he do? It says that he will pay the full cost himself in redeeming us. Now there's his glory. He pays it. But in so doing that, there must be something that must be done. God can never at any point downplay on his justice. At no point can he say, well, you know, I'm not going to burn out the full amount of my justice here. No, he has to enact his full justice. It would be wrong that if you were in court against somebody who'd done something wrong to you and the judge said, I like this person who did wrong to you. I like him. We support the same footy team. I'm going to let him off on a lighter charge because I like him. And you're going to go, but justice was not served. If the judge said, I like him, but you know what? You did that. And this is what the law says. You must face this. You will go, yes, justice is served. For God, justice must be served to the full extent of the law. Never skimping on anything. The full extent of the law. And so what, is, what does the law say? In in Romans 6.23, it says that the wages of sin is death. God says, I will take on human flesh, and I will go onto the cross, and I will die. Justice will be served. And so we look now at Romans chapter 3, verse verse. Verse 25 and 26, this is what he has done. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. A little bit later in the same letter, Paul writes in Romans 5, he says, Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also righteous, one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, many will be made righteous. So what is being said here? One sin destroyed all of humanity, but one act of righteousness saves. That's the way that God works it. And Christ is now presented as the sacrifice but in presenting himself as a sacrifice, he does it, and we heard about this last week, through the process of substitution. My life for yours. And in so doing this, that substitution, he says, I will be the propitiate. I will take the full wrath of God, the full justice of God, is meted out on Christ. Now let's pause here for a moment, because many Christians... Um, we suffer from what we could maybe call a spiritual self-esteem crisis. And that happens when we don't understand this doctrine of justification, which is always to the glory of God. If I struggle with this idea that Christ substituted himself for me and he full and he took the full propitiation, the full wrath of God, if I struggle with that, I cannot be my own substitute. And I cannot substitute myself for somebody else because I've got my own sin I have to deal with. 
So I find myself in this dilemma. I am useless in this sense. I'm powerless. There's nothing that I can do. And, if, and the moment that I, that I admit there is nothing that I can do, now God can do something with me. But because we are constantly trying to think that I can do something that will help God along, I get in the way. It's like me that I'm in the courtroom the judge is about to pass sentence upon somebody else, and I think that I can help the judge. And I stand up and I say, uh, excuse me, judge, can I just have a uh, piece to say about what you should do? I would be held in contempt of court. And the moment that I start to fiddle with this thing, thinking that I can do something to help God along with this, in the courtroom of God, I am in contempt of court. Ever been held in contempt of court? Well, I think most of us, if not all of us, are pretty guilty of being held in contempt of court in God's court. For thinking we can add value to the work that he has done. We are trying to play with his justice. Let's, let's move on. and see This act that God has done by being the substitute um, and... And, and by being the propitiate, this has made us right with God. And now how do I receive it? I may be, be thinking, well, maybe I need to take my wallet out and start to pay something. Why would I pay something back to God if he owns it already? Can't do that. There's nothing that I can do. I can't serve enough. I can't do enough in church or outside of church. I can't do enough. All that I've got to do is resign myself to the fact that when I stand there, I'm totally helpless. And the only thing that I can do, the only acceptable work before God in the court of God is to say to him, I believe. I believe you did that for me. And I accept it. I accept it. Now the problem arises, and we have a problem with this. We start to think that there's just that one sin that God does not forgive or hasn't forgiven. And it comes rushing back to us, and it catches us, and we start to get sucked down in guilt and condemnation. And then we live in that. And the problem is that we also pass it on to others. As we um, give them a false theology. That we start to make people feeling condemned and brought down. Well, there comes a warning with this. And as I was preparing the sermon, I was going through, oh gosh, I am in trouble here. Because um, as soon as we venture into this space... We now have to be really sure we know exactly what we are doing. We need to really read up on, on this and become an expert in law. Because I'm pretty sure you're not going to find an advocate to assist you in this. So you're on your own yeah. I'm on my own yeah. And before I even begin to bring this up before the Lord, there's this one sin that you haven't forgiven me of. I've got to realize that what I'm doing, I'm entering into the courtroom of God, which I'm allowed to. I can come boldly before his throne, that, that throne whose foundation is justice and righteousness. I can boldly come before there on the basis of the blood of Christ. But what I'm doing now, I am arriving there with my sheet. And I'm wanting to read out the arraignment, the reading out of the charge to God. And what I'm doing effectively is that I'm saying that Lord your act of redemption short paid on my redemption and there are now unsettled accounts because there's this sin you didn't forgive and I'm charging you on this and further Lord I'm saying that you failed 
to fully exercise a righteous administration and execution of justice because there is unfinished business and I have found the loophole. You didn't forgive this sin because I feel the condemnation. And lastly, my third charge would be <laughs> is that because you have not fulfilled the correct administration and execution of your justice and that the redemption was not fully, fully paid, therefore, the righteousness and justice of your throne is substandard and you don't deserve to sit on that throne. I do. Are you ready for such a case? Then I suggest you drop that condemnation now. Right where it is. Because we are now in the big leagues. <laughs> we do not hold on to it at all. Because the price is fully paid. The justification, the justice of God is, there's no loophole. That he has paid for that sin, it has been forgiven. You and I are made new. The work, the work that he has done is complete. And it is glorious. Worship team, won't you start making your way forward? And so what do we find? That glory of God, that sheer weight of who He is. That when He's thrown, when He is enthroned in our lives, His righteousness and justice, when He's throned in our lives, That it is the glory of God that when we could provide no convincing, reasonable, or logical evidence for why God should forgive, accept, and love us, that God stepped down into creation, took upon human flesh, dwelt among us. He went to the cross. He substituted himself in my place. He faced the full wrath of the justice of God as it was administered and executed upon himself. He became the propitiate for sin. And then he has offered us the way to freedom so that he could have a reasonable reason to forgive, accept, and love us. And the reasonable reason is Jesus. Let's worship the Lord.